here just a couple of minutes early just to get some of the administrivia out of the way. Um, first of all, this session is usefully labeled no IP, which is some kind of shorthand for uh, stealthful sniffing, logging, and intrusion detection. Useful and fun things you can do without an IP address. I'm not here to advocate the um, doing away with the IP protocol. I'm just here to talk about how you can live without an IP address on one or more of your security systems. Um, following this presentation in this exact same room will be Huagang Tsia with his presentation on LIDS, the Linux Intrusion Detection System. I think, is that right? And, huh? Yes. Can I move it down? I'm too loud? No. Oh, muffled. Okay. My speech is slurred and I haven't even heard it. Drinking. Is that better? Is that less muffly? Okay. Um, and after that, at the th oh, th at the uh, thirteen hundred hour, one o'clock p.m. Um, Thomas Rude is not going to be presenting. Instead, we will have T Dragon, who will be speaking about making non-portable systems portable. So. Any system is portable if you've got the physical strength, I guess. Okay, and what else? Oh, this year's conference is being recorded on video and audio CD-ROM. The recordings may be purchased at the recording sales desk located in the Parthenon foyer. Thank you, DEF CON. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And, oh, and what else? I got some stuff I'm supposed to give away. And um, I think I'll start off with a trivia question. And that is, um, at what layer of the OSI seven layer model do IP addresses reside? You, um, who I saw first, yeah. Layer three. Layer three, that is correct, we have a winner. It wasn't in the form of the question, but I don't give a rip. Um, okay, you have your choice. You can have a glamorous and useful Spark IPX, or you can have a Zyplex Mongo switch. I don't know what speed it is, but it does appear to be Ethernet. <laughs> Damn, I want an ArcNet. <laughs> you can run Barbar over ArcNet. It's been done. I love the first person. I'll tell you what, you come here and grab a piece of gear, and as long as it doesn't affect the audio presentation, I'll be cool with it. <laughs> so. Biggest laptop. <laughs> <laughs> You'd probably be happier with an IPX. Yeah, this is what's a bit all. Oh, okay. Um, for the second one, let's see. I'll do I'll do another giveaway, and then if people stick around at the end, I'll do another giveaway. There, there's an incentive to not bail on me. Um, the second trivia question is. Um, oh shoot! You have to know stuff to ask questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> I know what. Um, the, those of you who might have been here at Hacker Jeopardy last night, what is the number of the request for comments dealing with the TCP protocol? Someone way in the back there with the beard. Yes, yourself. Um, I'm looking for a large positive integer. Um, <laughs> let's see. You in the yellow shirt. No. Um, you. 793. 793. Thank you. The man knows his RFCs, or at least he knows his drinking games. Um, his punishment is a Spark Station 10. <laughs> it appears to have a processor. Congratulations, sir. It'll take two, you know. You can get them on eBay, like, for 300 bucks. Okay. Um... Oh yeah, I'm supposed to give a speech. Okay. So, stealth receiving, logging, and intrusion detection. Stuff you can do without an IP address. The program today is as follows. Um, I'm going to introduce why you would want to do this. I'm going to talk about how to do it. I'm going to talk about network architectures in which it might be useful to run one or more systems without IP addresses. I'm going to talk about some specific configuration tips, mainly focusing on stealth logging, because to be perfectly honest, it's trivial, trivially easy to set up a stealth sniffer. Um, there's one command, exactly. 
Um, but stealth logging, centralized logging, is a little bit uh, a little bit trickier, and uh, so that's where a lot of the examples will come from. Um, and in fact, as I'll mention, um, a lot of n network applications can use um, IP-free interfaces. Uh, uh, you know, TCP dump, snort, pretty much anything that looks at packets um, below layer three. So. Okay, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And then I don't really know why I made six and seven separate points. Oh, I know. Point six is where I ask for people to share their own stealth war stories and to ask questions. And point seven is where I shut up all together and leave. So, okay. Um, there's not a slide for that last one, though. Okay. Um, Introduction, who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, I wrote this slide not so much because I'm an egomaniac, um, um, which isn't to say that I'm not, I guess, but rather to give a little bit of context for why I'm here and why I'm standing on the stage instead of sitting in there. And um, basically, I'm a security consultant, like many of us. Um, my day job is mainly with firewalls and with secure network uh, infrastructure design. And um, the long and short of it is, lately what I've mostly been doing is working in financial sectors and keeping the bad guys out of bank accounts. Um, what I also do on the side quite a bit, and it's kind of ludicrous to say on the side since it takes about as much time, is writing. Um, anybody here read Linux Journal? And you still came. Wow, that's so cool. Um, I write the security column for Linux Journal. It's called the Paranoid Penguin. And if you read that column, you know that my whole thing as a writer um, isn't really so much that I'm an expert do as I say, but more along the lines of, or at least that's how I think of it, is, hey, I got this working in my basement. You probably can too. So um, that's very much the spirit of this talk. Um, this, I'm going to warn you, and feel free to leave if this really disgusts and disappoints you, but the stuff that I'm about to talk about isn't the result of decades of experience running systems without IP addresses um, as much as it is about me messing around in the basement and figuring out some kind of groovy stuff that you might find groovy and useful too. So that's the, that's the disclaimer, and that's my excuse for any, anything that I say that is some combination of lame, stupid, or inaccurate. So, okay. Um, and what else? Oh, and the other point that I wanted to make about myself is that I'm into digital defense. Um, I was really delighted that that was the track this talk got put into, because that's what my work is all about. Um, I think that it's a lot of fun defending systems, and it's really challenging and interesting. Um, and you get to use pretty most of the same skills that you would use if you were of a more evil bent. Myself, I really suck at evil, so that hasn't been too much of an option. Um, please don't use what I'm about to tell you for evil. Thank you. If you do, don't mention my name. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so why on earth would you want to run a system without an IP address? Well, in the particular cases of intrusion detection system probes, which is to say boxes running, uh, a box running something like Snort um, to do network intrusion detection, or in the case of a centralized log host, where you want your web servers and your FTP servers to send its logs to, um, since they are on the network, they are obviously subject to the same sorts of vulnerabilities as any other system on that network. So this is kind of a paradox. You've got systems on the network that are trying to protect that network, but they're vulnerable to exactly the same stuff as everything else on that network. Okay? Um, it's particularly important, obviously, which, with such systems that they not be rooted and, uh, and remain available, and that the data stored on them is trustworthy. Okay? Um, the first thing anybody with a rootkit does after they root a system, if they know anything, is commence to erasing and altering logs. Okay? Um, the cool thing about a stealth logger is it has no IP address, and so it's very difficult, if not impossible in practical terms, to uh, attack remotely. I mean, I guess if you rooted a box on the same network and laid some layer two voodoo on it, you could DOS it or something. But I don't think it'd, it'd be uh, practical to get too much further than that. Um, if you've got your logger just sitting on the wire and listening to packets that go through, those packets you can be reasonably sure um, 
haven't been messed with. Because uh, logging typically uses UDP. That goes by pretty quickly. Um, it's, it's not really feasible to hijack a log session. Now, you can construct false packets and put those on the wire. So you're still vulnerable to that sort of log data tampering, right? But, you know, that's, that's one risk with the others that you're going to kind of lump into the back of your mind and say, eh, <laughs> hope that doesn't happen. Um, the, uh, so that's the value of a stealth um, uh, log system. A, in the case of an IDS probe, uh, same thing. You don't want it to get attacked. You don't want it to be compromised. You want to be able to trust the, um, the things that it tells you. Okay. How do you do that? How do you protect those boxes? The answer, obviously, is by not using an IP address. In that way, you have eliminated, or at least heavily mitigated entire classes of attack vectors, IP-based attack vectors, right? And that, of course, is the main vector that you're trying to protect the other systems against. Okay, any questions so far? Not that any of this is terribly deep, but... Okay, cool. Um, so, what do you do? You, um, in a nutshell, you configure the box that's going to receive stuff. You, in other words, you install an, uh, an Ethernet interface in it. Maybe it's an additional interface. I'll, I'll talk about uses of, of multiple interfaces. Um, you bring it up. You, uh, if, if you're going to be doing your stealthful stuff on a switched environment, it may be necessary, desirable to hang a little hub off one of those ports and then connect it to the hub. Um, if you're really paranoid, you can use a sniffing cable. Um, that's a one-way cable. It's receive only. It's, that makes it physically impossible for your system to transmit packets. Okay? This is cool both for purposes of stealthfulness. Um, it won't respond, for example, to port scans that way. Um, I mean, it wouldn't anyhow if it didn't have an IP address, but uh, layer two type of scans it won't respond to, our broadcast, that sort of thing. Um, and the other value of the sniffing cable is that if somebody were to do something weird to this machine somehow, um, they wouldn't be able to do weirdness out through that interface at least. Okay, um, another thing you, you might need to do on systems that send to a stealth logger is map uh, a bogus static ARP entry to the bogus IP address that, that you have everyone send their log data to. I'll talk about that in greater depth in a minute. And that's pretty much it. And <clears throat> if you really understand that stuff, that might be all you need to know and you can go. But I've got pictures, so stick around for the pictures. Here's picture number one. Let's talk about architectures, um, architectural considerations for using um, a stealth sniffer. Um, probing the DMZ. This is, of course, where you've got the crown jewels. A DMZ network, if you're cool, is where you isolate all of your publicly accessible systems from your internal network. And I could talk on and on about network architectures, because because like I said, that's my day job. But um, the, in, in, if you're unfamiliar with it, the, in, a, in a DMZ network, what you typically do is you break off a dedicated interface on your firewall, and that is what you will connect your, your, a DMZ network to. Um, what this allows you to do is it allows you to define different rules on the firewall for this stuff than you would on the inside. In other words, it lets you treat traffic destined for and originating from, and that's really the important one, that network from your internal hosts. The beauty of that, of course, is that should one of these boxes in the DMZ get rooted, um, say they, they, somebody exploits um, a vulnerability on your Apache web server. Okay, they've rooted that box. Well, now they still have to hack their way through your firewall to get at, at anything on the inside. And the chances are, if you've done this right, you will be allowing practically nothing originating from the DMZ to enter into the internal network. So anyhow, that's the obvious place to put an IDS probe or a packet logger or whatever. Um, now in this diagram, I show only one interface on the stealth probe. Um, and the assumption is that you would administer this from the console. Or you could put another interface in the box one with an IP address and connect that to a dedicated admin LAN. I've, I know people who do this and they'll have a separate physical media 
you know, network devices, a separate IP space that they use for administering boxes that are connected to other networks. Those m the machines on that network don't do any routing. They're specifically configured not to forward packets, but they allow the administrators to, you know, secure shell into that box or whatever and see what's going on um, on the non ip interface. Um, is that clear so far, by the way? I kind of threw a lot of architecture stuff at you in just a couple minutes. Okay. Here's another architecture. Same thing, but including a probe on the internet. Um, <clears throat> take that a step further, and you can have probes everywhere. Now, you notice that at this point, you're running into you know, kind of a scalability issue. You've got probes all over the place. Um, this is not something you can really get around in a large environment. Right? You need different logical and physical subnets are going to need different IDS probes. And incidentally, um, I should mention that um, if you've got a switched environment, one of the challenges is that um, if you have low end switches, you can't really do sniffing across switch ports very easily. I mean, there may be, you know, uh, there may be a means of tricking it into. To, to broadcasting, but that probably isn't even desirable from a performance standpoint. Um, if you have a high-end switch, however, it may have a mirror port. And actually, this is something to consider when you're designing uh, LANs that you intend to, hold, to, to hang IDS probes. There are a couple of considerations with a mirror port. A mirror port is a port that you tell the switch to send all traffic to. Normally, a switch is selective. Um, it, it, it only sends packets to the hosts to which those packets are addressed. I'm like a hub that just broadcasts everything. And with a mirror port, you're saying, okay, for just this one port, act kind of like a hub, send everything there. Now, the, there are a couple problems with this. The first is that the whole purpose of a mirror port is for uh, LAN diagnostics. And so you as a security admin may potentially be competing with your network colleagues for use of that port. Um, I actually um, work with one client who, who has that situation, and it, and it works okay. But once in a while, the, the IDS, an IDS probe in a given LAN will have to be unplugged so that they can plug in a sniffer and figure out you know, why their Novell network doesn't work or whatever. Um, not, not something that's insurmountable, but something to consider. The other problem with mirror ports is that um, the, type, the very types of switches that are likely to have a mirror port are also likely to have an ungodly huge backplane. And even if that mirror port is a, giga, is a, a gigabit Ethernet port, if you've got a 9 gigabit backplane, you're obviously not going to see quite everything. Now, if anybody has had experience of the contrary or knows the ways around this, by all means, speak up. But um, the, the guys that I've talked to um, that focus solely on IDS, you know, agree that, yeah, I mean, you do wind up missing some stuff that way. Okay. Um, now, if you're like me and you've got a little spaghetti network of your own at home with not too horribly many um, boxing, um, you, it is possible to have a box with three interfaces, one for the DMZ, one for the internal network, and one for the outside world. And there's a couple of different, the, the, the obvious benefit to this architecture is um, you only need one computer to dedicate to this purpose, right? Now, if it's actually going to be doing network-based IDS on two different networks, that's going to have to be better than a P180, let's say, right? Um, but on the other hand, if you've got a, a relatively low-impact site, you don't necessarily need a, a 2 gigahertz monster in there either. Um, this is, however, kind of dangerous, because what are you doing here? Um, What's the difference between your stealth probe and your firewall at this point? <laughs> Physically, very little. Logically, a lot, of course. I mean, uh, in this architecture, you, you don't have an IP address on the DMZ. You don't have an, uh, an IP address on the outside. And you may or may not have one on the inside. Um, it's certainly justifiable, depending on, on your stomach for risk, to say, well, I'm going to IP the internal interface so that I can administer this box. Because if anyone gets so far as they're able to attack that interface, they're already inside. It's game over. So you may or may not consider this really dangerous. Uh, the, the other reason, of course, it's dangerous is because it's connected to all three networks. Um, if this box gets owned and reconfigured with IPs, you know, <laughs> then, then they've got carte blanche access. But again, you, 
if they own this box, you're, you're in deep trouble anyhow. So that may or may not be um, a showstopper for you. Obviously, however, this doesn't scale. You would never, ever do this in anything but uh, a relatively small uh, network or a set of networks. Okay, so those are some... Um, some architecture considerations. They apply equally to IDS uh, environments and to um, packet logging um, and uh, centralized logging things as well. Although in the case of centralized logging, <coughs> you, the, you know, you're not going to be receiving logs from the internet probably. You're probably just going to be receiving them from us in the DMZ and on the inside. And on the inside, you may, you may decide that it isn't necessary to do the stealth thing at all for logging. Okay, so you've got a box, and it's going to be a stealth box. Um, you install your network interface card. You fire up Linux or whatever, and the, and the kernel recognizes the card. What do you need to do now to configure it? Well, if, a Unix box, if it's a Unix box you, and the interface comes up as ETH1, you just do an ifconfig ETH1 up. Any questions? That's literally all there is to it. The, now, if you rely heavily on things like, in the case of SUSE, YAST and YAST2, or in the case of, uh, of Red Hat NetConfig, um, life can get a little bit weird, and you may, may wind up having to go in and, and, and hack your auto-config scripts to... Um, I, I had to do this with uh, my SUSE box. I had to put s some, uh, some information in rc.config so that it would cope with the fact that there was this additional physical interface, but not actually assign the darn thing an IP address. Um, but at the low level, you know, as far as the kernel itself is concerned, this is all that's required to activate the, um, the interface. Just bring it up. At that point, your user space applications will be able to access that device by name by, you know, dev ETH1. Um, okay, let us uh, depart for a second from the Unix operating system and talk about building a stealth cable. Not a whole lot to this. Um, they don't work, this particular stealth cable design doesn't work for switches. It only works for hubs. But it's cool because um, you'll notice that you've got some loopback going on. What happens here is the green, of course, is receive. When packets come in, they come down the cable just as they would normally. They also get looped back to the transmit um, wires, to the, to the transmit terminations. That gives you a link light on your hub. It's a bogus link light. The hub, think, the hub thinks that you're, you're sending traffic every time you receive traffic, but you're not. You're just bouncing everything you receive back out to the hub. Um, you might think that that would cause some sort of, you know, endless loop, but it doesn't. Um, I use these at home. If you build one yourself, I highly, highly recommend that you use solid core cable. It's a lot easier to, to, to cram two solid, solid pieces of wire together and squeeze them like with a, with a wrench a whole bunch of times and cram them into an RJ45 connector than it is um, stranded cable. Um, stranded cable, of course, basically turns to mush. So you push and it just goes... <laughs> um, I've tried to doing, doing it both ways and I got nowhere with stranded cable. Maybe there's some type of... Uh, maybe, maybe it was just the type of uh, mail connector that I was trying to use. But um, The other thing is, and I should have mentioned this a lot earlier, the, resolu the resolution on these projectors <clears throat> is kind of crummy. Um, don't be alarmed by the fact that this is blurry. Um, the slides on your CD-ROM are perfectly legible. And so if you, if you want to refer to this diagram, check it on the CD-ROM. Yes? Uh, what's the problem with using this with a switch? Doesn't work. <laughs> I'm, huh? Right, right. No, the, the problem is that there's no way for a switch to receive your MAC address. A switch won't give you the time of day unless it recognizes a MAC address at your port. That's, I'm sorry, I was a smart ass. Um, won't happen again. Again, I promise. Uh, if you enable the monitoring port, that uh, wouldn't matter. I don't think it would. I don't think it would. I guess it depends. I mean, switches... Switches tend to vary somewhat between manufacturer and how they handle mirror ports, I would guess. It ain't like I have one, so I don't know. Huh? Wouldn't this cause a collision for every packet it sends up? Um, hasn't so far on my hubs. On a switch, I don't know. That's hard idea why it doesn't work on a switch, because it... Uh, 
that's quite possible. And it's, I'm sorry, I should be re repeating questions. The gentleman um, asked whether this would cause massive collisions on a switch, and and uh, I think that that, pro that very likely is uh, why the, why it would not work. Now, I shouldn't stress, however, that the method of using no IP on a switch can work in the specific case of. Um, of stealth logging, and I'll talk about how using using bogus ARP entries. That works just fine across a switch. It's uh, just for sniffing sniffing proper, you know, where you want to see everything on the wire. That you pretty much have to be on a on a hub port, not a switch port, unless it's a mirror port. Any other questions about the receive only cable? Yes. Oh, okay. The gentleman suggested that to get rid of the, colli the collision, all you have to do is set the port to full duplex. Cool. See, now you've got access to super elite hardware that you can manage. I don't. The switch does what it does. <laughs> but yeah, a managed, a managed switch, on a managed 10100 switch, you would be able to set it to, to full duplex, and the collision problem would be solved. Yeah. So maybe you could make uh, this work. Um, the fact, I'm sh uh, I didn't have the time or the inclination to figure out how to build a receive-only cable for, uh, for a switch. But that certainly sounds like it could work. OK. Oh, and incidentally, I got I to gotta give full credit. Um, I didn't think of this myself. This is not original. I took this from the Snort FAQ and converted it to the beautiful graphic before you. It was originally ASCII art, so I did do something. Yes. Oh, right, right. Yeah, your arc, temp, your, your arc table on the switch would get royally screwed up um, by the loopback. That's absolutely right. It would fill up. Then it would revert to port to a hub behavior, and you'd be home free. <laughs> <laughs> At which point you'd get like two megabits throughput. Okay, um, <laughs> let's let's shift the discussion now to a somewhat narrower focus, uh, and that of stealth logging. Um, the reason I'm not going to talk about stealth IDS. Uh, explicitly or stealth packet logging any further is because it's just it, it's easy there's nothing to do at this point you know after you've brought up the interface it optionally used a, a, a super paranoid receive only cable there's nothing else to do other than to do a, a snort dash i ETH, eth1 um, you know maybe specify a config file whatever I mean it'll work just fine at that point TCP dump same thing specify the interface and it'll just work um, we've got a little bit of more work to do, however, if we're going to do stealth logging. Now, if you're doing IDS, you can just configure the snort the way that you normally would, and point, you know, uh, configure Etsy snort, snort.conf um, with the rules, or pointers to the files that contain your rules, um, and so forth. And that's no different whether the interface in question has an IP address or not. That in itself is actually kind of cool, isn't it? Um, but <coughs> doesn't involve extra work. Um, but for stealth logging, you're going to need a special rule. Um, now the stuff, oh man, that's totally illegible. What a total drag. Oh, and you know what? This is not on the slides on your CD-ROM. I apologize. At the, t at the time that I um, was frantically trying to get these slides ready, which was like three weeks ago, um, I was also finishing a book Building Secure Servers with Linux, O'Reilly and Associates, October 2002. I'll try not to plug it. Um, <laughs> so I didn't really have my act fully together. So I apologize for that. But if you go, and this, this URL is at the end of the presentation too, and it's also apologetically inserted on the dummy slides on your CURM. If you go to defconx.wiremonkeys.org, you will find this slide um, in all its glory and um, in full resolution. But anyhow, what it says is, um, okay, um, any net is considered the external net with, you know, in other words, look at everything in the same, um, with the same, same weight, basically. Uh, we want to look at packet com contents. We've got a config dump underscore payload. But we want to see ASCII. There's really no reason to, to have the hex, the hex dump. Uh, and now let me back up a second. What are we doing here? What we're going to do is we're going to configure a stealth logger. 
right? It's got an interface without an IP address, and what we wanted to do is listen on that interface for um, syslog or syslog ng packets sent to UDP port 514. Is anybody here um, completely unfamiliar with the concept of remote logging? Don't be shy. But just in, okay, just just in case anyone is is both ignorant and shy, I'll explain it. In remote logging, you ignorance is cool. You can fix that. Um, <laughs> in, with remote logging, what you do is instead of well, in addition to configuring syslog or syslog ng or whatever you use on your Unix system to log to a file, you also say send some or all log packets to this host. And by convention, this happens on UDP 514. So you have some central logger, you know, with an IP address usually listening on UDP port 514. And the the packet format's really simple. It's just IP header. Um, UDP header such as it is and um, let's see sending hosts name as the sending host specifies it you can lie that can be fun um, priority level and facility priority level of course is the severity of the message um, facility is the type of log message which is sort of arbitrary it's user definable um, I mean there are standard categories like ma like mail and kernel and, and so forth but it's perfectly possible to configure your, your logger to send mail messages you know, to the current facility. Um, but anyhow, um, where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. So that normally happens on UDP 514. What we're going to do here is configure our stealth logger to sniff packets that it sees optionally addressed to a specific bogus stealth logger ID or IP address, sniff those packets, strip away the IP header info, and just save the payload of the log packet. And so, okay, so we're going to tell it, um, dump the packet payload, that's the part we're interested in. Don't bother with, with the hex, just give me ASCII. And, um, you know, the, uh, I've got a default log directory where snort logs go. That actually won't be used in this case, except as, as if, if, if I were to, to not use fully, a fully qualified path name, it'll stick that in front. Preprocessor frag2, we want it to rebuild fragments. Fragged log packets will probably not be as useful to us as complete log packets, right? Um, and then now here's the meat of the config file. There's a line that says log UDP source, in this case, you know, 192.168.123.0 slash 24. In other words, the class C address dot 123. Um, on any, any source port, source ports are arbitrary, right? More or less. Um, match packets that are addressed to 192.168.123.111. Is there a host that actually has that IP address? No, emphatically not. The whole point of this exercise, the, the, the only reason that, um, you, you could write this rule to say any as the destination, right? And, but what I like to do, what I like to, to do is pick some IP address at random that none of, none of the hosts on this segment are actually using and send packets there in the sadistic hope that an attacker will try to identify and attack that system. But it doesn't exist. So um, it involves a little bit of extra work with configuration. On my loggers, I'm going to have to put an, a bogus ARP entry in for that, for that IP address. But anyhow, that's what this rule says, is look for packets. It, for, to me, I don't know, I like the idea of specifying the destination on my snort rule for, for sniffing packets. Um, uh, and then in parentheses at the end, then it says log to my file. And my, you know, my log file, that's just the name of the file that I want to stick these packets in. Now at this point, we're telling Snort to log the whole packet. We, we kind of have to. Um, we can't, th there's, there isn't any easy way that I know of to get Snort to only log the packet. Um, Wow, is that ever disturbing? I guess I'm glad I skipped breakfast. Okay. Um. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to hope that that wasn't some sort of statement, you know, as to the... Oh, the dude scored 75 points in the scavenger hunt that way. I think we all should get some points for that, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If anybody feels really traumatized um, and having some obsolete junk would help. 
I can help. I can offer some junk therapy a little later on here. <laughs> thank, thank the vendors who contributed the useless junk, not me. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Where was I? Oh yeah, so we gotta have this log rule. Um, obviously on a stealth log system, we don't want to actually be looking for intrusion detection. I mean, I guess maybe you do. I guess you could have it do both, but um, that would make for a more complicated example, so it doesn't show that here. Okay, now the way that you would fire up Snort to act that way looks a lot like the way that you would fire it up to do IDS. You specify a configuration file and you tell it to run in daemon mode. Um, Obviously, in this case, it's our truncated little teeny snort.com file that just has the one rule saying look for um, log packets. Um, we also use the dash i, I flag to specify an interface. Actually, you probably, you probably want to, you know, anytime you fire up snort, but for sure you need to hear. You need to tell it, listen on that stealth interface, what has no IP. Okay. Now, um, are you following me so far? We've just configured our central log server to sniff its log packets off the wire, right? Um, now we're going to do on each host that actually sends log data, um, what we're going to do are two things. First, we're going to conf configure our logger on that system, our log facility, to send to the bogus um, IP address so that it puts the packets out on the wire. Now, if you use a bogus IP that's local to the LAN, you are going to need, in addition to the, to the appropriate configuration stuff in syslog.conf or in syslog-ng.conf, you're also going to need that static ARP entry, ARP entry. If you skip that part, if you don't have a static ARP entry saying, hey, the MAC address of this bogus IP is this bogus MAC address. In this case, E-I-E-I-O. Because um, <laughs> I have little kids, and that was on my mind at the time. Um, <laughs> and if, if you're doing this across the switch, you could, in fact, make that the real MAC address of your log server, so that the packets actually get to the stealth logger. Um, obviously, you are now making this system known to the switch, right? But, you st but it, the system isn't actually configured with that bogus IP address. So it will be possible for people, if they want to, to deliver packets to that host, but that host will drop them because it doesn't have an IP address. Okay. Um, I'm, except, of course, for log packets. Was that confusing? Was that clear? Ask two yes or no questions and then figure out which the answer applies to. Good, Nick. <laughs> Was that, um, should I explain that further? No? Okay, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so the static ARP entry. Uh, entry. Um, okay, once we've done that, oh, and well, why don't I talk briefly about what I added to syslog.conf? That's really easy. I'm telling you in this example, what I've got is star dot star, semicolon mail dot none, semicolon news dot none. I'm looking at the second line here. What this is going to match is all packets, all, uh, all log messages, except um, those that involve mail and those that involve news, because typically you've got a dedicated log file for those, and unless this is an SMTP gateway or a news server, you probably don't care about seeing news and log packets, you know, from a security standpoint so much. Well, yeah, actually you probably do. Well, anyhow, for whatever reason, I've configured this to not send those to the log server, and what it's going to do is instead of logging to a file like the first line, um, I'm going to send to an IP address. So I, I use an at sign and then the IP address or host name of my central log server. Now remember that that 111 is a bogus IP address, but what this is going to cause my logging host, my web server or whatever, is to construct these packets addressed to this bogus IP and slap them out on the wire. Okay, syslog.ng looks more complicated, I guess it sort of is, but if you use syslog.ng, which I highly recommend, um, it's much more powerful. So we need to d define a destination, we've got a, a destination named d underscore log host, and that's, uh, th that's um, a destination that uses UDP, we give the bogus IP, we give the port, we can use any port we want, by the way. We don't have to use 514 for this. As long as you're, as long as you're um, sniffing for packets using the port that you set here on your sending machines, it, it can be anything you want. I used 514 out of mental laziness. Um, so we've got our destination. For filter, let's, we want all packets that have got severity of info or higher. Okay? 
Um, so that's what that filter says. And then we've got a logging rule that says log anything that, pa that matches our filter called filter and send packets that match to the destination d underscore log host. Okay, any questions on, on configuring your logger to send to the bogus IP address? Yes? Um, how do you, the question is, how do you prevent ARP poisoning? I don't know, how do you? <laughs> huh? Yeah, I don't know how it doesn't matter. Our poisoning really um, is only going to pertain to switches. I guess what you could do is, I mean, if you knew that, if you as an attacker knew that the sysadmin had set up a stealth logger and that the, the box that you just rooted is sending its logs to a bogus IP, I guess you could mess with that ARP entry for some reason. And I mean, that's not really our poisoning. That's just our futzing. But, um, but you know, I mean, at that point, um, I don't, I'm not too sure how much worse that is going to make your life than it already will be at that point. I mean, the, which is to say, obviously, if somebody roots a box that is doing remote logging, from that point forward, the logs aren't trustworthy, whether they're being logged locally or being transmitted. Um, the, the whole point of this exercise is that the logs sent up to the point where the attack succeeded will be on a central log server in a place that they can't easily be erased or tampered with, okay? So our poisoning, yeah, I don't know how you'd prevent it in this case. Yes? Ooh. Higher end switches can lock a port to a specific MAC address. Again, I have no experience with higher end switches. I use cheap Aussie crap. Can you tell that I've got issues with that? <laughs> got a little bit of resentment there? <laughs> um, okay. So, we've set up our, our receiver, you know, we've set up our stealth log point, we've set up our senders, and now um, packets start going over the wire. What do they look like? Um, they look really blurry. Um, <laughs> Here, here we've got a standard snort outputted uh, packet on top. We've got your IP header and timestamp and, and then the data payload. Um, now this isn't too bad. I mean, I mean you know, you can, you can po quite possibly live with this as your syslog file format, you know, and, and make sense out of these and just kind of mentally ignore the first three lines. And the first three lines, you might say to you, I mean, you might think, well, that's really important to log the IP header, right? So that you know that the packet really came from the, the host that it said it came from. But see, the thing is, to a point, you sort of trust, you know, until they've been rooted, you trust the host sending the packet to not use a bogus name in the data payload versus whatever would reverse resolve from the IP address and the IP header. So in my opinion, in in practical terms, there's really very little of value in that IP header, okay? So what I like to do is I like to pipe um, these packets as they're logged using tail, tail.f, through awk and strip away everything up to the first left angle bracket which, as it happens in syslog packets, so far as I've seen them so far, doesn't show up until you hit um, the... Um, Oh, what does that number ref refer to? I guess um, message, excuse me? Process ID, thank you, process ID. Um, that's going to be the first pa uh, angle, left angle bracket that Block encounters as it parses this packet. And then I have it take everything after and including that left angle bracket to that string of equal plus, equal plus, equal plus that Snort uses as a delimiter between packets. So then what you wind up with is the same thing but missing the first two lines. Um, you get slightly more compact logs that way. So let's, uh, th this is another slide, incidentally, that is not in, um, on the CD-ROM, but is on my website, the defconx.wiremonkeys.org site. Oh, that's right, because I did this one like yesterday. It will be there. <laughs> it will be there like within 48 to 10, 24 hours. So. <laughs> Okay, so that's it. I mean, that's, that's really all there is to it. At that point, 
now your your self logger will be sniffing the wire for for log packets, stripping away optionally stripping away the IP header info and saving the the, the data in uh, in a big file. Um, it's you can run multiple instances of snort if you want, so that you can write those to different files. You can there's all kinds of different ways that you can um, uh, fit this to your own needs. At this point. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions, comments, observations. Let her rip. It'd be a very simple internet program to write a UDP generator that would just flood your store logs with fake records without having to remove the box at all. Yeah. So how would you keep it? Yeah, um, the the gentleman observed that it'd be really simple to write a packet, uh, a program that would flood your network with bogus log packets and what fill up the server that way. Absolutely, that's true whether you've got a stealth logger or a regular centralized logger. That's that's a, um, a problem that's inherent to remote logging. So you're right, that's a problem. Um, the I'm sorry, what, what sir? Yeah, if you, uh, this gentleman pointed out that if you use a non-standard port number, then it's a little bit less obvious. I mean, if you're filtering on port, I don't know, 999, then people can send ports, uh, packets sent to some other port will be dropped by Snort. They won't be logged. But you can use, you can certainly use TCP-based log packages, yes. Um, and that's the cool thing about Syslog NG. Syslog NG can let you define a destination that uses TCP rather than UDP. Again, you can use any port you want, and um, you get increased reliability. You also get increased process overhead, but that's, you know, if it's a dedicated logger, that probably is not a problem. So yes, excellent observation. I should have mentioned that myself earlier. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's a, that's an excellent idea. Um, you could use IP tables, um, or for that matter, IP chains, um, running locally on the stealth logger to um, filter out any packets not originating from your actual DMZ servers that are sending the logs. Yeah. Now, if one of those gets owned, it can be used to do the to, to do the flood, but if it doesn't, it can't. Yes. You already have the attack info, so do you really care? I don't have to say no, first of all. Yeah, I do, I do too. I mean, the, this is not a technique that will prevent any type of attack, right? Except, specifically, IP-based attacks on the stealth server itself. That is to say, IP attacks that are meant to um, actually compromise the box, gain access to it. Um, you are not going to prevent other types of weirdness happening on the wire. You're just going to improve your odds of logging that activity or detecting it with an IDS probe. This is, this is really um, a last line of defense kind of technique, as remote logging and IDS are anyhow. Yes? An early slide had a parenthetical statement about something being that program. Oh, yeah. Yeah, how do, how do you protect your hosts from IP-based, how do you protect your loggers from IP-based uh, attacks? By stealth logging, that's how. By not, by not using an IP address. It was a lame attempt at a joke, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> other questions? Yes? Yeah, can you use, could you use the same machine both as a stealth logger and as an IDS probe? Absolutely, yes. Um, that wouldn't scale for sour grapes. You wouldn't want to do that on a really large 100 base T network with a, a bunch of really busy servers. Um, you wouldn't want to do it on you know a gigahertz Ethernet switch with a mirror port, <laughs> you know, um, or gigabit. I mean, excuse me. Um, but something like mix home network, yeah, that would work. Um, there might be certain advantages to separating the functionality, but I guess I kind of doubt it. See, the thing is, I guess the reason my whole mindset is that you dedicate a host to, to being your stealth logger is because um, I've got really old, slow hardware at home that I use for this kind of thing. So, that may or not... Oh, here's the guy with the high-end switches. Yeah, what do you want? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, you could do that. That's that's a really good suggestion. Rather than if you didn't want to use a bogus IP address. Um, uh, in the way that I described, could you use, you, could you map your static uh, ARP address, uh, excuse me, your static ARP entry to FF, 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 one, two, FF. Yes, you, you definitely could. And at that point, um, your log packets would be, would be broadcast even on a switch. Oh, I see. Oh, that's so cool. I'm really glad I came today. <laughs> <laughs> you win some hardware, sir, because I think I get the impression that you don't have enough really old hardware. So, <laughs> what is this? This one has got 20 ports. Ooh, it's got serial ports. You can hook up T1s to this sucker. Except, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the really cool one that's got gazillions of Ethernet ports. Oh my god. <laughs> And at no extra charge, you get this Ethernet module too. Gee, I hope I didn't break it. <laughs> it won't be replacing my 3668 time soon. <laughs> uh, but it could be a backup to it, couldn't it? <laughs> Ooh, I shudder to think what airport security would think of, of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's got these fingerprints on it. Are they my fingerprints? You don't know. They could be, could just be gummy bear fingerprints, couldn't they? Um, okay. Well, anything else? I guess I'm supposed to shut up soon. Yeah. I'd like to thank you for not using Microsoft PowerPoint. It is my pleasure to not use Microsoft PowerPoint. <laughs> But then I'd have to pay for Microsoft PowerPoint, wouldn't I? I mean, have we not established that I'm a total scrounge? <laughs> no real virtue there, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes? Come again? Oh, of course. Um, the schedule changes are as follows. Um, next, as scheduled, will be Hua Guan Xi who, if, and if I mispronounce it, I, I really apologize, who will be presenting on LIDS, which is really cool. So I highly recommend you stick around for that if you're interested in kernel level IP protection, or actually the system protection, it goes way beyond just networking. Um, and then after that, rather than Thomas Wood doing next generation data forensics, we will instead have T. Dragon, who will speak about making non-portable systems portable. And oh, and also, I, I, I've, I've skipped this one before. Fezzi, or is it Fozzie, will not be speaking on shell code. Instead, the ever popular speaker, I think I met this guy once, TBA will be presenting. <laughs> so. Greets to TBA if he's here. Huh? <laughs> oh, he's in, in the third room. That one, uh, oh, and incidentally, that the one that, that Fozzy was scheduled for was for one o'clock. Um, in the third one, we'll be as scheduled. Nate Rochaffer doing a thing on biometrics. What is his subject? <laughs> <laughs> it's secret. It's undisclosed. Yeah. Anyone need like directions to the airport, current time, something related to my talk? Um, afterwards. Oh. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks for getting up. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your stay. I will be.